Alright, today is Tuesday, April 6th, and this is a post-market review for the stock market activities today. We have uh, yet another day of lackluster volume, and the market continues to play the game of Tetris, finding gaps on day-to-day -day basis and filling those gaps. For example, yesterday it was the turn of big cap technology stocks to rally higher. Meanwhile, we saw big losses for the mania names, the high valuation names in the software sector of the market, SPACs, new IPOs, Chinese companies, solar names, all underperforming significantly. Today the market wakes up, looks at the map and decides, well, wait a minute here. We pumped the inflationary trade, we pumped the reopening names, and we pumped the big cap technology names. The only laggard left are the mania names, which also happen to be the retail crowd's favorite names. We're talking about solar stocks, plug power, blink charging, sketchy Chinese stocks. These are the names that caught a bid today. So what do we make of the market action today? Nothing at all. It is typical behavior of low volume activities in the market where in certain cases, the action in the options market, specifically call options buying, could easily create many gamma squeezes. And the path of least resistance of a low volume market is usually higher. The point to take here is we cannot base any investment decisions based on the market activities from last week and this week. Yet this behavior usually precedes big movements in the stock market, meaning that there is a massive move brewing behind the scenes in this market. And this move will happen either way, to the upside or the downside. And for us to know the next direction the market will take in this imminent breakout depends on the three dynamics we have discussed before. Number one, the virus. We have more good news leading us closer and closer to complete economic reopening in this country. So the market is not worried about the virus yet, absent of a black swan. And therefore, it is unlocking the door of inflation. And we know from the macroeconomic data that we've been receiving the last couple of weeks that inflation is rising higher and commodity prices continue to rise higher with exception of uh, crude oil prices which took a pause in the rally but the rally will resume in oil prices so long as the reopening is intact and more progress overseas specifically in the eu will also unlock the door for higher prices in oil and therefore the most important factor impacting the market is treasury yields. Treasury yields also paused the rally higher and today we saw sizable declines in yields not breaking any bullish trend or creating any reversals or bearish trends but the pause in the impulsive rally had important implications in the stock market specifically positive implications for the nasdaq and you saw the nasdaq rallying impulsively last week and so far this week and there are multiple reasons behind the pause slash decline in treasury yields mainly the portfolio rebalancing that started taking place last week in this video we will review more data to get more clarity and more indications on what the next move in the bond market will be in addition since we don't have any major development that took place in the market today i do have extra time to go over viewers questions and comments and that will take place during the conclusion of this video but for now i got a market to cover and here we go the dow industrial average closing in the red down 96.95 points or a decline of 0.29 percent the nasdaq also closing in the red down by 7.21 points or a decline of 0.05 percent the s p 500 closing in the red down 3.97 points or a decline of 0.10 percent and what about the sector's performance for the day leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal consumer cyclicals at number two capturing the silver communication services and at number three for the bronze consumer defensives meanwhile the laggards of the day led by healthcare industrials and technology you can't help but to notice the fluctuations of performance between the different sectors one day a certain sector is in favor the next day it's lagging but if you are paying attention you would have noticed 
that the consistent performer is consumer defensives. Moving on to review the futures market activities, starting with crude oil, bouncing slightly from the massive declines that we saw yesterday, both the WTI and Brent managing to close at about 1% apiece. And we also saw declines in the US dollar, and a decline in the US dollar is good for commodity prices. For example, what about softs? We do have sizable gains here, led by coca, coffee, lumber, cotton, sugar, and then OJ. I did participate in the rally for softs futures by buying sugar contracts. And as you can see from the chart, we do have a crossing in the MACD imminent, and sugar futures have been on a downtrend since the highs back in February. And the expectations are that we are about to start another leg higher for sugar, turning the tide on the negative trend. What about metals? The most sensitive futures regarding the US dollar. We also saw sizable gains here, led by platinum, silver, palladium, gold. Meanwhile, Dr. Copper decided to set out the rally. Moving on to meets futures, muted activities across the board. Moving on to grains futures, we do have muted activities across the board, with exceptions of sizable gains led by soybean oil and canola futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, and let's see what's going on here. Leading the pack at number one. Apple, with just a little over 1 million contracts, about 73% of those were calls. Tesla, number two, with about 550,000 contracts, about 55.5% of those were calls. And at number three, GM, General Motors. And we saw big call options buying activities in GM today. I do have news for the name in the headlines of the day segment. GM, with over 360,000 contracts, about 83% of those were calls. How about we move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? Starting with the ticker VIPS for VIP Shop. This is one of the names that got whacked in recent weeks, specifically after the fallout of Archegos Capital. But the name managed to bounce higher today due to elevated levels of call options buying, which I am assuming influenced a lot of short covering in these names. The Chinese names, the mania names, stay-at-home names, all catching a bid today. And if you do the digging, you would have noticed that the put-to-call ratio for these names was highly tilted toward calls meaning that we saw elevated levels of call options buying in these names and therefore triggering a mini gamma squeeze, which in turn triggers short covering activities, helping these names to bounce higher. But in this case, for VIP shop, they are buying the 35 calls expiration date, April 30th, with expectations that the name will rally over 11% by then. They paid about a buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $3 million. What about the trade for the ticker GM, General Motors? We talked about the elevated levels of call options buying today. Here's an example. Somebody's buying the 66 calls expiration date, April 16th, with expectations that the name will climb over 6.5% by then. They paid about 50 cents to enter this trade which brought the total all the way to about $800,000. What about the trade for the ticker Triple Qs, the NASDAQ? Here we have a bearish bet picking a top perhaps, or it could be insurance. Anyhow, they're making a bearish bet by buying the 308 puts expiration date, April 23rd, with expectations that the Qs will decline over 7% by then. And they paid about one buck a piece to enter the trade bringing the total all the way to $1.3 million. What about the trade? The bottom of the table for the ticker AMGN. This is for Amgen. Amgen is not a usual name that you see in these lists that I present to you every night. So when I do see trades in names like this, I do follow the trade. And in this case, I followed the trade for Amgen. 
because perhaps somebody knows more information than available to the public. In this case, they bought the 265 calls, expiration date May 21st, with expectations that Amgen will gain over 6.5% by then, they paid about 2 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $2 million. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker ARKKKK for ARK Invest Kathy Wood ETF? They're making a bearish bet by buying the 110 puts expiration date June 18th with expectations that the name will decline over 11.5% by then. They paid about 5 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $3.5 million. What about the trade for the ticker KR? And this is an interesting one because the KRE, the ETF for regional banks, have been tracking the movement in treasury yields, meaning that the KRE appreciating when we see treasury yields rising higher and declining when we see treasury yields pulling back. In this particular trade, they are making a bearish bet on the KRE and as a proxy making a bet against treasury yields. So this is very interesting because it is sort of contrarian given all the facts. They bought the 61 puts expiration date May 21st with expectations that the name will decline over 9% by then. They paid about a buck a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1 million. Moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with macro news. And today was a slow day, yet we have some important updates. For example, regarding the jobs report that we received last week. It was a solid jobs report, a very hot one, almost 1 million jobs created in one month but when you peel the onion you start to find some flaws one of these flaws is permanent unemployment we haven't made significant progress in permanent unemployment the jobs created were pretty much pulling forload workers in the leisure travel hospitality sectors of the economy and here we have another yet concerning regarding long-term unemployment and in this case, for those who've been unemployed for over 26 weeks, excuse me, 27 weeks, that number has now reached the highest reading since 2011. The highest reading in about a decade. Either that these people are legitimately struggling to find a job, or perhaps a huge chunk of those been unemployed for over 27 weeks might have stumbled on OnlyFans and discovered that you can make a lot more money doing OnlyFans than taking a crappy job. And no, I'm not joking by the way, because we are about to see a very hot jobs market which will lead to wage inflation. And we know that the Federal Reserve and the Federal Government are well to tolerate inflation and even deny the existence of inflation and they will say we're not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising interest rates but here it is god forbid your wages start to go higher than this whole act about not thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about anything will go down the toilet so fast your head will spin along with the water in that toilet because when wages rise higher, Wall Street suffers. Their margins shrink and they start complaining to the Federal Reserve. And it looks that we are heading that way because here it is with a net of 1.7 million individuals expected to retire earlier than expected. There will be likely more jobs openings for younger Americans and it is shaping to be more job openings then there are people looking to work because all of these uh, boomers and old timers over 55 they are retiring they're cashing in their stock market gains 401k gains and they are planning to enjoy their retirement slurping coconut water on the beaches of florida the big question is will the younger generation fill these jobs because we will see a lot of jobs openings specifically giving the trajectory of higher inflation, encouraging companies to spend now, higher now, rather than waiting and paying more in the future. But again, keep that thought in mind. Are young people even interested in getting these jobs? Because number one, we have a lot of stimulus, a lot of uh, unemployment payments, in certain cases paying you more than the actual wage you were earning at the job. At least that was the 
situation last year. The second point is we have Robin Hood. A lot of younger folk discovered Robin Hood. You can sit in your ass, gamble in the stock market, and you could make more money in a week than you would have made working for three years. Likewise, another segment of the young population discovered only fans. They discovered that they can make tens of thousands of dollars, in certain cases millions of dollars, strip dancing and uh, selling pictures of their feet online. And that certainly beats working 9 to 5, isn't it? So here is the challenge. Perhaps this is yet another illustration for the upcoming wage inflation. The services sector is growing at the fastest pace on record with hotels, restaurants paying up. Pay attention, paying up to attract employees and they are finding new job applicants more demanding than in the past. It is almost like the staff is interviewing you, meaning that people are not desperate for jobs like they used to before. Because diamond hands, bro. Take a look at my paper gains. Take a look at my stimmies. Take a look at my OnlyFans earnings. Do I really need this job or do you need me to work this job? Who has the power here? And companies will have to pay up more in order to attract employees. Are we not even talking about competitive, highly competitive sectors of the economy. The likes of technology, software, engineering, there will be lots of competition here to attract the talent, meaning that you have to pay up a lot more to compete with other offers, leading to higher wage inflation. Where were all these jobs when I was looking for one, certainly feels good when you walk into an interview and the interviewer needs to take Xanax, not the other way around. And you know this whole uh, organizational behavior management, all that crap? Well, now employees will not be submissive and subordinates anymore. Because worst case scenario, if I get fired, who gives a shit? I'll make more money strip teasing on OnlyFans. And you know the deflationary camp, they are still in denial and they bring the dumb argument that yes, commodity prices are rising higher. Yes, yields are rising higher. But the third condition is not met and that is gold prices rising higher. Even though gold has an extremely weak correlation with inflation, it is more correlated to treasury yields. And the recent relationship between gold and yields is inverse, meaning that gold is no longer reliable indicator for inflation. But the other argument they bring up is debt, and debt is deflationary. Well, here it is, at least from the consumer side. The credit card non-performing loans, these are the charge-off rates, meaning the default rates, pretty much down at all-time lows. Meaning that a lot of us use the stimmies to pay credit card bills. And now all of these banks have the least rate of defaults or the risk of defaults ever. These credit cards are hot, fresh, and ready to be slid up and down, up and down once the reopening actually happens. The pinned up demand. We're waiting and waiting and waiting like a bunch of coked up zombies for the gates to open to start splurging all over the place. I know, but I don't see inflation. Where is inflation? Where is it? I'm, I'm looking for it. I can see flies, but I can't see inflation. You know what was uh, driving inflation expectations higher the last few weeks? The situation at the Suez Canal, the blockage, all the cute memes, remember? But thank God they managed to open the blockage because on these ships, there were a lot of animals in all of these containers. And if the blockage continued, they would have perished inside of these containers. I mean, they're being shipped to get slaughtered anyways, but uh, would you rather die in a container or in a processing facility? I'll tell you, if I was a goat, I will use my uh, persuasive skills to talk the butcher into becoming a vegan. And of course, the blockage at the Suez Canal lifted up inflation expectations. And once that blockage was removed, inflation expectations were tampered once again. But here it is. Wait for it. There is more. Traffic slows in the Suez Canal as tanker faces difficulties. Here we go. Here we go. And here is more. Remember the three dynamics? The virus, unlocking inflation, unlocking treasury yields. You're smart enough, you remember. Here it is. Good news in, uh, quote-unquote, defeating the virus. It's not really defeating the virus. It's just uh, normalization. California plans to lift most COVID restrictions by June 15th, but it will keep the mask mandate. 
Now, I know a lot of Californians, like myself, who are so excited of going back and about, back and about, out and about, bars, restaurants, shows, you name it. But I guarantee you, after two weeks of uh, mingling with the masses here in California, you'd wish we'll have another lockdown. I'm allergic to people. And of course, our uh, beloved governor, King Dracula, aka Kim Jong-un Newsom, is in a lot of trouble. And he got recalled because he pretty much destroyed the state. And we're not just talking about the COVID lockdowns. Some of that was necessary. We can go back and forth arguing about that. But the state has been a disaster way before COVID. And it got a lot worse since this guy took over. Anyways, don't get me started. Let's move on. We're talking about inflation. Inflation this, inflation that. But rest assured, Mama Kathy, aka Tesla witch Kathy Wood, is also denying inflation. Why? Because it serves her purposes. And of course, uh, Reverend Elon was asking her on Twitter, what do you think of the unusually high ratio of the S&P market cap to GDP? Meaning that even Reverend Elon is starting to question the valuations in the stock market. And he is uh, quasi referring to the Buffett indicator, although the Buffett indicator pins the Wilshire 5000 versus the GDP. But anyhow, here is uh, Kathy Wood with the response. GDP statistics evolved during the industrial age and do not seem to be keeping up with the digital age. Thanks to productivity, real GDP growth probably is higher and inflation lower that reported, suggesting that the quality of earnings has increased significantly. Have you noticed that everybody's dumb to Tesla witch Kathy Wood and she's the only one who figured it out? It's all about digital disruption, revolution, genomic, using all of these buzzwords to attract the donkeys to open their wallets. I can sit right here and make a bet all you want. Ark Invest will end up the same way the Manhattan Fund back in the day and all of these uh, dot-com funds ended up. Just a fad that lasted in one crazy bubble. But even if you deny inflation, we can uh, have uh, Mama Kathy and we can ask her about inflation and she's going to deny it and play it down. But one thing she cannot play down is higher taxes. And it seems like uh, Uncle Joe is determined to raise taxes. And the truth is he has no choice but to raise taxes, given the insane budget deficit. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And uh, Uncle Joe is targeting tech companies. Tech and drug companies risk losing many of their tax planning to planning planning tools that allowed them to pay low rates for years. What's going on here? The provisions, part of the administration's plan to finance a 2.25 trillion infrastructure package, mean that tech and pharmaceutical companies could lose many of the tax planning tools that allowed them to pay low rates for years. This is aiming to prevent gaming the system entirely, said Matthew Gardner, a senior fellow at the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy. The party does seem like it is over. I repeat, the party does seem like it is over. Now, we can go back and forth arguing about what is the right taxation rate for corporations, etc. But one thing we can agree on is that corporations haven't been paying their fair share. And I know some of you, the libertarian crowd, believe that corporations shouldn't be taxed. We're not living in fantasy land. We're living in reality. And I do understand that we have to keep our companies globally competitive, but also hold them reliable for paying their fair share. Is it fair that Amazon will pay 6%? In federal taxes, when you and I pay in excess of 30, 40, sometimes 50% in taxes, is it fair when Facebook, who made massive profits last year, ended up paying 12% in taxes when small businesses across the country, mom and pops, paying over 30% in taxes? Is this a fair system or is this a rigged system? Because corporations had it good, very good. The marginal taxation rate was the lowest since the 1930s, and now it's time for them to pay their fair share. The problem is, when they pay the fair share, their margins will be squeezed, meaning that the insane mania in the stock market of stocks exceeding insane valuations, that's not going to happen anymore. The party is over, and the stock multiples have to be contracted. So you have higher taxations, you have inflation, and you have more regulations, specifically in the technology sector of the market. Coming up, but the market keeps shaking it off like Taylor Swift.
Keep shaking it off until you start crying and writing songs about your former boyfriend, Papa Jerome. And here it is. You know, they've been saying that the STEMI is excessive trillions and trillions of dollars added to the national debt and budget deficits, destroying the future outlook for the next generation. But it was necessary. It was a must do to save the poor from this pandemic and this economic crisis. But you know, and I know as well, that all of these uh, crises are the best thing that ever happened to the rich. The 1%, the ruling class, because they throw a fit, they start screaming and crying that they're about to go down because they've been gambling with stocks, buybacks, and bonuses, and now they don't have any cash. They need to be bailed out. They need more stimulus. They need to loot the treasury and rob the taxpayer to be rescued. Otherwise, they're going to have to cut jobs and make these politicians look bad. And they get to win every single time. Those stimulus packages, surprise, surprise, did not go to help the poor and the middle class. Matter of fact, the government's $5 trillion stimulus gamble, they call it a gamble, that's very interesting. The government's $5 trillion stimulus gamble mostly paid off, but here it is, missed poorer Americans along the way. Surprise, surprise. But honestly, who cares about the poor, these bums? Who cares? The middle class, they should work harder. Stop complaining all over the place. We are a happy nation, a satisfied nation, a blessed nation, so long as our beloved celebrities are doing okay. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the big K, Kim Kardashian. And here it is, California's finest product. We managed to export the Kardashians all over the world. You're welcome. Kim Kardashian has officially achieved, achieved billionaire status for the first time, according to Forbes, who announced her inclusion in their world's billionaires list. You know her uh, sister-in-law, Kylie Jenner, she wasn't satisfied with her looks, so she went to the plastic surgeon and said, make me look like my sister. So they did, and she became richer than her sister. But wait, here comes Kim Kardashian from behind, catching up with her little sister. You're a billionaire, now I'm a billionaire. And since we're talking about uh, inequality, the widest income inequality gap in history, let me uh, rub it in your face a little bit. Perhaps you'll appreciate this rub because it's coming from uh, Kim Kardashian's behind. Maybe not, maybe you'll suffocate to death. But anyways, Kim Kardashian's booty is rumored to be worth $100 million. I repeat, Kim Kardashian's ass is worth $100 million, at least according to the latest insurance filing. And this is not even the NFT virgin. Oh, the NFT virgin, that's worth uh, $200 million. You gotta pay a premium for imaginary stuff. You get the fake ass, the fake, fake ass. But think about it, $100 million for Kim Kardashian's booty. That is worth more than your entire life. Matter of fact, what is your life insurance? $500,000? $1 million? You're not even worth one pimple on uh, Kim Kardashian's booty. Matter of fact, you need 100 lives to just be worth one cheek of Kim Kardashian's. And my question is, does booty insurance include insurance from gravity because that's the biggest enemy and the question here is now that uh, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West are divorcing they have to split the wealth right you got to go 50 50 when you get divorced for these rich people at least so when the divorce is finalized does uh, Kanye get to keep one cheek I don't know how that works but uh, I'm not a legal expert anyways think about how insane this is right it's ridiculous you're gonna go to your wife tonight and say oh honey look at me I'm gonna work so hard to get that promotion next month. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kim Kardashian in the next 24 hours will make more money than you will ever make in your entire life with her just sitting on her fat ass. And yet they keep selling you this uh, American dream. You know, if you work hard and you follow the rules, you're gonna make it and have a house and a happy life, yada, yada, yada. Meanwhile, it's a big club and you and me are not in it. It's an invitation only club. You only get in there by invitation or by uh, a leaked sex tape. God bless America. I want to stand and salute that. 
And lastly, what about the health of retail brick and mortar businesses? What's going on here? Not so hot, so even after we reopen the economy, the digital age will stay with us. At least this is according to UBS. UBS projects that the U.S. will lose over 81,000 retail locations over the next five years. Imagine being a hedge fund manager and you are looking at this chart right here and you're saying, OK, we're going to see the disappearance of retail businesses and everything will go digital. So I'm going to short GameStop. And then a bunch of maniacs over at Reddit decide to pull a trick and trigger a short squeeze. And your life turns into hell. Diamond hands, bro. Moving on to market sentiment news and continuing on the Archegos Capital Bill Wong story. And it gets crazier by the day, by the way. With every detail, the magnitude of this crash, this blow up in Archegos Capital is stunning. And here we have Guggenheim's boss Minard, and he says that another Archegos style blow up is quote unquote highly likely. So what is he talking about here? It is highly likely that we are going to have another situation like that because such as those losses incurred by Archegos tend to continue to cascade until the market corrects and flushes the risk out of the system. We had many warning signals, starting with GameStop to the rise in yields to the blow up of Archegos Capital. We also have crashes that took place in the mania names, Palantir, Plug Power, Fuel Cell, you know, the retail favorite names. And back in the dot-com bubble, the crash did not happen right away. It actually happened gradually. First, you saw the highest mania names, the most insane names, blowing up all the way back in 99. If you remember the globe.com, for example, pets.com. And then gradually, you saw the big names, the likes of Cisco, Intel, Microsoft, also crashing and having to spend over 20 years in certain cases before recovering the dot-com era highs. Some names never recovered. Cisco, Intel, still below the dot-com highs. But keep shaking it off. Shake it off. And here we have the risk chief in uh, Credit Suisse, and she lost her job. She had one job to do, and she failed at it, costing the firm over $5 billion. Do you put that in your resume? Anyways, moving on. What about the real earnings yield for the S&P 500 collapsing by the day and now reaching almost to the lowest level since 2008? You see that big spike in the chart during 09? That was the opportunity to buy stocks. The opportunity is not when the real earnings yield is collapsing. But are market participants paying attention or not? Of course not. Moving on to corporate specific news, starting with Peloton. Peloton got upgraded by, here it is, Credit Suisse, saying that you should buy the stock. You know, the geniuses that they are just lost $5 billion. I'd rather take financial advice from the kid who's selling tamales at the street corner rather than Credit Suisse. But in this case, they're saying buy Peloton. Why is that? Because they are broadening their demographics, meaning in the past, Peloton used to be an item for the rich. But now, in the year 2020, during the biggest mania, the highest growth for Peloton came from people making under 50 grand. And the buy costs, what is it, four, four thousand, three thousand bucks? So that's about seven, eight percent of your total income spent on a stupid bike. And then you have those banking between 50 grand and 100 grand. Also massive, impressive gain for Peloton. I wonder what happens when uh, people start buying things they can't afford on credit. Hmm. What happened the last time? We saw this kind of behavior. Anyways, who cares? Tom Lee says we're about to see a face ripper rally. That's all I care about. Moving on to Johnson & Johnson. You know, I'm still waiting at the vaccine buffet. And I was thinking about getting the Johnson & Johnson with a side of fries. But now I'm a little bit hesitant because here it is. 62 million doses of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine need to be checked for contamination and may need to be thrown out. The New York Times reports. I guess I'm just going to have to stick to fries. And here it is. What about GM, General Motors, an all-electric Chevrolet Silverado truck? will join an increasingly crowded field of competitors from established automakers like Ford as well as startups such as Tesla and Rivian. You know what it is? 
Mary Barra deserves the title of the CEO of the year because she figured it out quickly. She realized that this is a mania and she has to milk the mania for all of its worth. And all you have to do is announce a bunch of EVs. We're going to do EV this, EV that, produce a bunch of commercials and the wallets will spread wide open buying the stock. In my opinion, Mary Barra is the CEO of the year. She knew how to play it and she managed to revive a zombie stock like General Motors and they don't even have to reinstate dividends anymore. GM remains a very hot play. And lastly in corporate news, what about Starbucks? Starbucks is starting a reusable cup trial where you can earn loyalty points. I like it, good for the environment and it reduces the input cost for Starbucks. Moving on to the heat map analysis and let's see what happened in the stock market today. The theme is clear. Take a look at the solar names, whether it is ENPH or SEDG, all closing in the green, rebounding from the massive losses of yesterday. Meanwhile, the winners of yesterday, chips and the big cap technology stocks, underperform today and what's also catching a bit is the mania names whether we're talking about snapchat spotify pinterest snowflake square palantir oh i'm sorry palantir is not participating i know it's bad it's terrible all of you diamond hands bros holding the bag in palantir buying the dip for the 100th time and it's not working i feel you it's painful horrible but other than palantir the mania names, in addition to the Chinese names, managed to rebound higher. And the reason is, we talked about asset allocations, you gotta buy something, in addition to the mini gamma squeeze in the options market in these names, leading to some short covering. What about the inflationary side of the market? We talked about consumer defensives, still outperforming, but the picture is pretty much muted whether we're talking about metals copper is muted today freeport mcmoran we saw some declines in steel but gold managed to rally slightly similar story with industrials muted picture with some profit taking banks similar story energy muted with exception of the name i happen on british petroleum bp closing in the green about three and a half percent gains and the reason is they have some specific news for the company and the reason why i picked bp over for Chevron and Exxon is the fact that British Petroleum already went through the dividend cuts. The stock threw a fit for a little while but then recovered and rallied higher, meaning that financially speaking, BP will have an easier time versus Exxon Mobil and Chevron. And what about the themes in the market, starting with the reopening trade, the nostalgia names. Mixed picture across the board, but this trade remains hot and we're not seeing significant profit taking for now. I do believe at some point we will have a sell the news phenomena and therefore I am turning bearish in some of these names. Not all of them, but some of these names that managed to surpass the pre-pandemic highs. What about the inflationary trade mixed picture but mostly negative with very modest gains here and there nothing is going on in the inflationary trade they're not taking profits they're not selling the inflationary trade but they're also not adding more inflow into this particular side of the market perhaps waiting for earnings first what about the deflationary trade opposite picture of yesterday yesterday was risk off let's buy the old school technology names that happen to be value in addition to big cap today was the opposite let's dump the chips big cap value tech and let's chase the mania names so once again we're playing a game of tetris yo-yo game whatever you want to call it but the action last week and so far this week is not reliable because it is not followed by a confirmation for example, high volume or a technical pullback in yields, for example, going below 1.5%. Moving on to the charts analysis, starting with the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. Anything new here? Not at all. We pretty much traded flat. We have all of these gaps going on, but we are in the series of higher lows until and unless that is broken the chart remains bullish moving on to the daily chart of the s p 500 the continuous contract we talked about the breakup higher we lift a gap in a futures chart which is quite unusual meaning that that gap that i'm pointing at right now on the screen should be filled one way or the other 
that gap has to be filled because this is a continuous contract. It's highly unusual that you see gaps in this chart. And perhaps we will go all the way to retest 3,960 for support. Now, the chart that I'm watching is the SPX, the cash index, from a weekly perspective because we still have a negative divergence but we have the rising wedge pattern. I want to see how the SPX closes the week. Will it break down and the rising wedge will play as expected? expected resulting in a correction or are we going to break higher there are cases of rising wedges breaking higher not the majority but it is possible so the weekly closing is very important and i'm watching this chart pretty much every day what about the Qs, the nasdaq anything new here not at all trading flat we are in a big breakout that is taking place via overnight pumping but it's not being followed up during the regular trading hours we see the pump overnight and then consolidating throughout the day. This is an indication that the rise in the NASDAQ, the Qs, is happening due to passive inflows from big funds. It's not happening due to retail participation or legitimate buying during the trading hours. Of course, we do have gaps to fill here, but they are far below, and we are looking for 323 if we go down there we have to retest it for support but for now the chart is on a breakout and it could continue to rally higher however when we switch to the daily chart of the continuous contract of the nasdaq we talked about this last night the 13,599 level and i told you that this will be a very sticky and difficult resistance we're not going to be able to just go by it and pass it easily or gapping above it we're going to have to pay the respect that 3599 deserves you got to wait there you got to consolidate building energy and then breaking higher just like the continuous contract of the spy did with 3960 and what about the iwm small caps from a 15 minutes perspective once again nothing happened are you starting to feel that it was a boring day today nothing happened trading flat we do have the gap at 218 it wouldn't be surprising for the iwm to go all the way down there and recheck 218 for support perhaps closing the gap what about the daily chart for the rut the Russell 2000. Once again, the series of higher highs and higher lows goes on. We do have a bear flag formation that's not going to go out of the table until and unless you close the week above 2264. We are watching an imminent crossing in the MACD. Could it happen? Could it reverse lower? That will be a very indicator to watch because we do have a negative divergence in the RSI signaling weakness. Now, when a chart is showing an imminent crossing for the MACD to the positive side and then it starts to dive lower again that is an extremely bearish signal and you can look at charts all you want every single time you're about to see a positive crossing in the MACD and it then reverses lower creating bigger columns in the histogram it is usually an ominous signal and a good entry for a short position and therefore i am watching the macd of the russell 2000 what about the dixie the dollar index tricky dixie what's going on here we talked about the reversal and we spotted the reversal via the action in gold and copper but we also had the resistance line we pierced below it just slightly and now we're back below it the level from which the us dollar can rebound and maintain the bullish pattern of higher highs and higher lows is 92. You gotta bounce higher from 92. Otherwise, this uh, bullish leg that's been going on since the beginning of the year, that will be over and the dollar will resume the trajectory to the downside. What about gold? What's going on here? The gold bugs are having a break. Gold has been rallying higher. Today, no exception. We are watching 1750. That is the next resistance. It's actually 1760, but it doesn't matter. It's in or around that area. And that will come hand in hand with the level of 92 in the dollar index. So you're going to watch 1750 in gold and 92 in the US dollar. If the dollar starts trading below 92, then understand that gold will start popping higher above 1750 and we will march all the way to 1800 remember gold has two enemies the dollar and yields today both of them were down so it's pretty much the ideal environment for gold to rally is it sustainable or not you gotta watch the dollar index and the yields chart what about bitcoin what's going on here i don't know i mean i'm trying to pick your side here for the crypto maniacs i've been bullish on bitcoin saying it will go to 68,000, but uh 
I don't know, it's not starting to look good here. Look at the negative divergence in the RSI. We've been watching that, crossing above it, the ultimate bullish signal, curling downward. Oh boy. And perhaps Bitcoin went down because China announced their digital currency. So Bitcoin, the future bro, somehow without China. And India, by the way, the two largest consumer markets. Whatever, moving on to the four hours chart of the 10 year treasury yield. You see the consolidation and the downward movement, the recent movement down from yields. This is what the market is liking. The market is liking specifically the NASDAQ and the mania names. They're liking the consolidation that has been going on in yields since March 15th. The question is, will yields resume the rally? We have to look for the point of 1.622 basis points. That should act as support pushing yields higher if you start making lower lows then the bullish trend will reverse and we will eye the level of one and a half going all the way down to one and a half and then bouncing higher and you are going to watch the level of 1.620 basis points i have it at 622 but who cares 622 600 basis points it doesn't matter you're gonna watch this level closely hand in hand with the level of 139 in the tlt chart because here it is just food for thought what if the tlt is making an abc pattern and we are seeing the start of the c leg where will the c leg go to close the gap at 139 could the tlt go all the way to 139 and yields go down to 1.6 perhaps 1.5 and then bouncing higher I'm just trying to read the tea leaves. What about the VIX? The VIX holding steady, closing the gap at 17.3 and now consolidating. In my opinion, consolidating to do what? To blast higher. But there are other opinions, the likes of uh, Tom Lee. Tom Lee says that the consolidation in the VIX right now below 20 will result in a downward leg and the VIX is going to go well below 15. And that will come hand in hand with a rip your face rally in the stock market. We'll see. Perhaps Neptune is uh, aligned this month. Moving on to Apple. 15 minutes chart. What's going on here? Nothing is going on. Trading flat. But we have to go down to 125 and retest it for support. And if you are looking at the chart and you want to cherry pick, you could see a head and shoulder formation. That could take us down. It's a 15 minutes chart. It's not a deal breaker. The daily chart remains intact. You are in a breakout on a bull flag consolidation all in all. But within that bull flag, there is a head and shoulder formation. Meaning from a 15 minutes perspective, we could go down to 125, recheck for support and see what happens from there. But a rejection from 125 will be a shorting signal all the way back to 120. What about Tesla, the souffle? What's going on here? We talk about the souffle every day in details. But here is another perspective perspective for you a one hour chart we have the cup and handle formation that broke to the upside and today we consolidated flat a gap higher overnight but no follow through from the regular trading activities and the options volume remains muted it had that one pop before the deliveries number and now we're back to trading at around half a million contracts so now what for tesla i have 1719 that is the resistance and the line in the sand for tesla to close above by the end of the week and here is another way to look at it from another fibonacci perspective we have a higher low and the challenge is for tesla to go down back to say 679 my number forget about fibonacci what does he know my number 679 you go back there and then you bounce higher now you made another higher low that would be the healthy way but if you go all the way down below 679 reaching the gap and then starting to close below the gap that will be a shorting signal saying hey there will be lower lows to come for tesla and if you watched last night's video i did discuss both the bearish bearish what is the bearish is that the, the greedy pig outlook no we talked about the bearish outlook and the bullish outlook in contrast a bullish scenario and a bearish scenario anyways moving on to conclude this video and let's do it via answering questions and comments from the viewers here is the question from the viewer says i see inflation exploding my question to you is how can i rebalance my 401k to take advantage of inflationary stocks i am currently in the s p 500 should i buy the dow or which index would you be in don't buy the dow in a retirement account because the dow is a price weighted index so let's say you have trouble with one of these big names then 
your retirement account will suffer. The S&P 500 is more inclusive and more diverse. In the long run, your account will stand making a lot of gains. Even if, say, a name like Tesla blows up and crashes, in the long run, that will be just a blip in the S&P 500. So I would stick to the S&P 500 because you will get exposure to industrials, metals, energy, financials, even defensives. It's more inclusive than the Dow. Here's the second question. Why are you so confident that yield movement is correlated to the tech stocks? My sensation is that this inverse correlation we have seen in the last weeks is already broken. It's not broken, it's always been there. For example, the case for buying technology stocks and growth stocks in the last 10 years was that yields are lower and the trajectory for yields are lower, even more, because the quantitative easing from the Federal Reserve. So if yields are going to go lower, you buy growth and you buy tech stocks. Now all of a sudden that yields are reversing higher, we're saying that the correlation is not real anymore. Now you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say buy technology stocks because yields are on the trajectory of going lower and then backpedal and say, oh, yields on the trajectory of rising higher. That doesn't matter. Technology stocks will continue to go higher. You can't have it both ways. Either higher yields are good for tech or they're bad for tech because there is a reason behind it. And that leads us to the next comment. High yields and inflation will be priced into tech stocks. I don't think tech will be depressed for long. Here is the problem with this kind of thinking. When we talk about higher yields and taxes that is different from, say, certain events or even earnings. With earnings, you have expectations and you have things priced in. For example, when stock rally is higher and then they produce and exceed the expectations and then the stock reacts negatively after reporting earnings, even though exceeding expectations, you can say, well, the results were already priced in. But when it comes to the movement of yields, it is a basic mathematical formula. Future earnings. Future earnings are amplified under low interest rates. But with interest rates and yields rise higher, the present value of future earnings get diluted. And therefore, when yields dive lower, it's a mathematical formula. Now all of a sudden stock X, stock Y rises higher because the mathematical formula says that the present value of future earnings is now worth more. Likewise, when yields surge higher, all of a sudden the present value of future earnings for the same company gets diluted. So it's not a situation where you can say, oh, it's already priced in. For example, even with taxes, let's say the tax cuts during the Trump administration, which caused a huge rally. Now, let's say that stocks rally higher ahead of passing the tax cuts and then when the tax cuts are actually initiated you see sell the news phenomena and you'd say oh that was already priced in and this is the reason behind the negative reaction of passing the bill in the market today but you can't say the same thing with yields and the reason is when it comes to tax hikes and tax cuts the number is known and it is specific for example cutting taxes from 28 percent to 20 percent so the market has an exact number to price in but when it comes to yields do you have an exact number for the ceiling of course you don't because yields could surge to 2%, 2.5%, 3%, 4%, depending on the macro factors impacting bond prices, in this case inflation. So once again, it's not something that you can just price in. So expect more volatility, a more jittery action in the market depending on how yields move. For now, the market got excited because yields traded flat for almost a month now since March 15th. But the question is, can you guarantee that we're not going to have another leg higher, another massive rally in yields? Of course you can't. Moving on, here is another comment. I really like your videos. The structure is superb. Content is great. Humor top notch. Thank you. I also like your take, but it is a bit simplistic. As they say, the market prices in, quote unquote, an increase in yields. We already discussed the fallacy of pricing in yields. It's not a question of whether yields go up, but by how much and how fast. It is actually all of the above, not just the velocity of the move, but whether yields go higher or not, because it is a mathematical formula. Every higher reading dilutes 
the earnings, the future earnings. So companies will have to increase their earnings in a pace that is more rapid than the rise in yields. It's a mathematical formula, folks. If the market prices in 2.3% on the 10-year by the end of 2021, after the correction and the current consolidation gave a better outlook, Nasdaq rally makes sense to some extent. But once again, you're assuming that 2.3% on year end, what guarantee do you have that it's not going to shoot higher? The Federal Reserve is not going to do anything about yields. We don't know where the tolerance threshold is. Is it 2.3? Is it 2.5? Is it 3%? We don't know. But we know that they are willing to let inflation exceed 2%. And they say that they will average 2% by eyeballing the action in inflation. There is no mathematical formula. They're not following any formula, which is a recipe for disaster, meaning that an overshoot in inflation is highly likely. That will come hand in hand with an overshoot in yields. So once again, it's not something that you can price in because it is a very fluid situation, unlike a specific number for tax cuts or tax hikes that you can easily price in. Continuing, saying, oh, this is just portfolio rearrangement slash low volume every time things don't line up with your preconceived notion is confirmation bias and intellectually lazy. Now, sir, I don't know if you watched the video last night, but I presented you with facts. Answer the question. Did we have low volume last week? And so far this week, lower than average. Is that a fact or fiction? Was there portfolio rebalancing? Perhaps the biggest portfolio rebalancing we've seen in years, at least from my sources. Is that a fact or fiction? Did we have portfolio rebalancing or not? Did they buy technology ETFs or not? Fact or fiction? So I don't understand the complaint here because... I am presenting you with the facts. People need to know the mechanics of the market. Why is the Nasdaq surging higher? Why are yields going lower? As we're announcing an additional $2 trillion of spending, don't people deserve to know the reason why the Nasdaq rallied and bond yields pulled back? Low volume, fact or fiction? Portfolio rebalancing, fact or fiction? I don't know. For example, probably tonight, you'll accuse me of having a confirmation bias because I said the mania stocks, the Chinese stocks, the likes of uh, VIP shop rallied today due to a gamma squeeze in the options market and short covering. And you're going to say, oh, you're just too lazy. You want to brush it off on whatever reason. No, fact or fiction. Perhaps you're too lazy and you're not doing the homework. I'm watching the data of the market. Look at the call options volume for names like VIP Shop, Peloton, Tal, the names that rallied today. The call options volume is way higher than the average and way higher than the previous few days, indicating that the action we saw in these names today is indeed based on a gamma squeeze and short covering. I don't know, fact or fiction? Do the homework. Look at the call options volume. Are we supposed to explain the mechanics of the market to people by saying, oh, stocks just went up, stocks go up? No, we have to explain the mechanics. Anyways, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.